Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is George, and I'm a digital transformation consultant at Sitecor, and I'm going to be your moderator for today. Now, I'd like to welcome everyone to the eighth week of the Sitecore Virtual Summit webinar series, which is mainly going to focus on testing and optimization. And we hope you're going to get inspired by our keynote speakers and our partners. Now, before we go any further, I'd like to do a quick sound check just to make sure that everyone hears me loud and clear. Now, could everyone please type yes in the Q&A panel below if you can hear me fine. Awesome, getting lots of yeses. That means a lot of people are on the call as well. Now, if you've joined other webinars I've moderated before, you know that I'd like to go over some housekeeping rules just to make sure that everyone um, has the best possible experience and everything goes smoothly. Now, all attendees are on mute. That's simply so we don't all talk through each other. However, you can ask absolutely any question you'd like throughout the webinar, and we're going to attempt to answer all of them at the end. Now, obviously, I certainly encourage a lively conversation. That's the only way we can learn from each other. Now, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded, and you're going to receive the recording in a couple of days along with the slides. Anyways, without further ado, today we've got Paul Boag with us, who is a founding partner at Boag Works. Now, Paul is a leader in digital strategy and user experience design. He's been working with organizations such as the European Commission, Oxford University, and Doctors Without Borders for over 20 years. Now, today, Paul will be talking about testing, iterating, and improving, basically optimizing your digital offering. I'm super excited to have Paul here with us today, but I believe that Paul is definitely a better fit to introduce himself. So, Paul, please take it away. Okay, thank you very much, George. It's great to be here um, for my third, my third presentation of this summit, which is, is very nice that, that uh, I keep getting asked back. So today we're going to be talking about testing, iterating, and improving, optimizing your digital offering. So put another way, really, it's why we need to do projects differently. Because um, as organizations, um, I think generally speaking, we've been running our digital projects in much the same way that we've probably run every other big project that we've had as an organization for a gazillion years. Um, and it's only relatively recently that we're discovering perhaps that isn't the best idea. Perhaps running digital projects in the same way as we run every other project doesn't make so much sense. And that's what I'm going to explore today. And that will circle back round to this idea of testing, iterating, and improving. Right. So I'm saying that we need to run our projects differently, that, that when it comes to digital, we need to do things in a different way. Well, why? Well, because a lot of organizations are approaching digital um, like anything else. They're bolting it onto the side of their existing business models. And the result of, of running these projects um, in the same way as a big IT project or a big building project has led to some fairly catastrophic failures. Um, so I, I, obviously a huge example, if you're based in the US, would be healthcare.gov. Um, which was phenomenally expensive. Uh, the last figure I heard was that it was looking like it was going to uh, exceed $677 million um, in cost. Unbelievably huge amount. But there are some other great examples in, in little old Britain, where I come from as well. There's a, a city called Birmingham, um, whose council, a, a city council uh, spent 2.5 million pounds on uh, uh, on their website at 2 million pounds over budget which is phenomenal there's also a, a department in the british government called the department of trade and industry where every time you visited that website it cost the uk uh, the uk government 11 pounds 78 per visit to the website and when i first heard that i went immediately to their website and kept hitting refresh, 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 refresh. And then I realized I was a British taxpayer and actually that was costing me £11.78 per visit. So I immediately stopped. And all of these problems have come about because we're not thinking about digital in a different way, that we're running our digital projects like our physical projects. So why are we seeing big problems like this you know why are so many digital projects failing why do especially larger organizations really struggle to make 
digital projects work? Well, at the heart of the problem is this. This is how a typical um, digital project tends to run, right? Or in fact, not even a digital project, any project. How any project runs. Basically, someone in senior management has a bright idea, right? For a new product, a new service, a new whatever, okay? Then a detailed specification is produced for that project, normally through lots of committee meetings, in my experience. So everybody sits around and discusses what the project should do and how it should work. Then development begins. Now, at this point, scope creep and change are the enemy. OK, because you've begun work on it you've, and you've spent so long getting the specification right, you, the last thing you want to do is change anything at that point. So you then spend all the money on getting this project out the door. Once it's done, once the project is finished budgets and people are reassigned and things move on maybe there's a small bit of maintenance kept you know uh, back in order to be able to um, you know just kind of maintain whatever it is that you produce in the project but that's basically the outline of a traditional project now that makes sense especially if you're building a building like is shown in this illustration once you start building a building that it's very expensive and difficult to change direction part way through so you need to invest so much time in the specification but it doesn't make so much sense in a digital world let me show you why so if we check out this graph for a minute on this graph you've got two axes you've got time along the bottom and you've got expenditure um, on the vertical axis. So on a typical, let's say, a website project, right? There's huge investment um, made in getting the website right, and then on day one, it launches. And for, uh, uh, but at that point, budgets are reassigned and go elsewhere. But with digital, you learn a huge amount about users at that particular moment in time. When, it, when your website goes live, then you start getting all this data and this feedback about the website. So what you learn about users skyrockets at that point, but all the money dries up. You see the problem? But that's not the only problem when it comes to digital. There's also this rather complicated looking graph that, that demonstrates another problem. So this is what you're seeing is the re website redesign cycle, okay? so. For one glorious moment, when you relaunch your website, okay, it's perfect, it's lovely, it's wonderful, it's working at peak efficiency. And then the money starts drying up because it's reassigned to other projects, as we've already demonstrated. Now, at that point, things start to deteriorate, okay? The effectiveness of your site starts to deteriorate. The content just becomes a little bit out of date, maybe a number of changes initially maybe um, your product offering ships uh, uh, shifts slightly maybe the news isn't updated as much as it should be all of those kinds of things then the design obviously design changes over time it's, it's, it's fashionable to some extent and so the design starts to look a little bit dated not looking quite so good also technology moves on at such a rate doesn't it and so the underlying tech starts to become out of date, less compatible with new innovations and new things coming along. So over time, the effectiveness of the website decreases. Now, there's a certain um, uh, point that comes where actually the web starts, uh, website starts to become an embarrassment. OK, so you stop referring people to it. You stop making use of it. It's no longer actually that that good for the business. If anything, it's damaging the brand. Eventually, things get so bad that someone in senior management throw their toys out of the pram and uh, a redesign project is launched and money is poured into the site and the whole site is thrown out. Good, bad, indifferent. The whole lot is thrown out and you start again. And then the process repeats every few years. How inefficient is that? How bad is that? There must be a better way. Things are made more complicated by the way that we tend to run our projects as well in, in terms of um, the waterfall methodology. 
All right. Now, you might be thinking um, if you uh, if you work in a more agile way in your organization, that m- maybe you're feeling a bit smug at this point. But don't get too smug. And I'll explain why in a minute. But let's talk m- typically about a normal project and how often projects are run. First of all, someone in management comes up with a great idea. They brief a project manager. The project manager briefs the designer. The designer then goes and produces a pretty design. Now, in a perfect world, that design would then be passed to a developer who would create it, and then the content edit, uh, creator would uh, fill in the content into the, the CMS or whatever it is the developers created. A nice linear production line that makes a lot of sense in a kind of physical world, you know, like production lines do. But the reality is often very different in our digital projects. What happens is the manager briefs the project manager, who then briefs the designer. So already we've got kind of whispers going on of what, you know, is the project manager interpreted what the design uh, the manager said correctly. The designer then produces a design that's handed back to the project manager who shows it to the manager. The manager says, no, that's not what I had in mind, and the, makes a load of comments some of which are just throwaway comments, but that's then passed back to the designer as an absolute, that has to be done. The designer then produces another iteration of design that's produced, uh, passed back to the project manager and again to the internal client manager, stakeholder, whatever you want to call them. And it goes backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards in this pinging, um, never-ending process until eventually someone gives in. Eventually a design is signed off, at which point, then handed to the developer. And the developer that um, look takes one look at it and goes, I can't build that. And the project manager says, well, you have to. We've got it signed off by the client. And so you end up with this really messy, complicated process. And at the end, the content creators have to pour a load of content into a system that's not fit for purpose. It's all a huge mess. Now, you remember I said, if you're, you think you're, um, you work in an agile way, you might be feeling a bit smug at this, moment, uh, this point in time because you don't work in that kind of way. But do you really? Do you really work in a different way? Because in my experience, the problem isn't so much um, in the waterfall uh, process, but rather it's in the departmental silos. A lot of uh, organizations that I speak to who say they work in an agile way means that their team works in an agile way. Maybe your team sits in digital, so you have got project managers and UI designers and people like that. Maybe your team sits in, in IT and it's the developers that work in an agile way. But if it's not the entire team, the the stakeholders or managers, the project managers, the uh, designers, the developers and the content people all working together, then it's not really agile, is it? You're still throwing uh, work over departmental silos from one silo to the next. And that is a fundamental problem um, that is incredibly damaging to digital projects because digital projects are very complicated. They have lots of different specialisms working together. And if those specialisms aren't working well together, if they're just throwing projects over the fence to one another, you're going to face problems. So then we get into another big problem, which is that many organizations are built around what I call a consensus-based culture. The larger organizations um, get, the more people are involved, the more stakeholders are involved. Also, the more um, business critical digital becomes, the more people have an opinion about what should be done and how it should be done. And so there are meetings and committees and consultations in order to work out the direction. All of this is very time consuming. So often digital projects can take years to complete. And the result is, is that by the time they go live, they're already out of date because the speed at which digital moves is so fast and so rapid. And so there are endless discussions and debates. Also, you know, that that kind of consultative process makes sense when you're talking about a project that has a high cost of failure, right? Consensus-based decision-making and waterfall all make sense when um, the cost is incredibly high. So if you're building a building, 
right? Once you start building that building, it has to be right, doesn't it? Otherwise, it's going to kill people, crush people. It's going to be bad. So as a result, you've got all these checks and balances. You've got committees. You've got decision-making processes. You've got very regimented um, steps to go through in order um, to ensure that what you produce is right. But here's the thing. Digital is different. Digital is fundamentally different to any other projects. And the reason is, for a start, the raw materials are free. Pixels cost nothing. So you're only paying for labor. So when, if you compare it to building an infrastructural um, project, like a, like a building or something like that, the cost of the materials is incredibly high. So you don't experiment a lot because it would be too expensive to do so. But digital allows us this kind of experimentation. It allows us to try things out. Also, with digital, you've got unprecedented data available to you. You could do, you've got analytics, you could do split testing, you can watch user sessions, you can look at social media mentions about a product, you can run surveys, you can do all of these things. So, Imagine, for example, that those principles of digital applied in the real world. Imagine you could build a building and then very cheaply and easily monitor how people use the building and just adjust it, just change it, change the layout of it, change the way the rooms are structured on the basis of what you are learning um, through monitoring and the data that you're gathering. That's the world that we live in with digital. But so many organizations have failed to grasp that fundamental difference between digital and physical projects. So how do these differences affect how we approach digital projects, right? What do we do differently with that knowledge that we've just discovered? Well, for a start, our projects need to start with a good deal of research. And in, in this regard, they're not dissimilar, actually, to traditional projects. You do your research before you start. You do things like set your objectives, don't you? What does the business want to achieve from the projects? What, um, what's in, uh, uh, what objectives are most important in the project? We should be looking at our audiences as well and, and asking ourselves, who our audiences are, what do they want to achieve, and to prioritize those audiences. And we tend to be terrible at doing this. And the result is that a lot of projects that we run, digital projects that we run, end up appealing to nobody because nobody's ever taken the time to prioritize the audiences. So there's kind of fundamental research that we need to do. We need to research the audiences themselves. What are their goals? What are their pain points? What questions do they have? What tasks are they trying to complete? What are their feelings? What influences them? All of this should be a part of our research before we ever begin a project. Also, you remember when we talked about um, a traditional project, a lot of projects began with somebody in management having a bright idea. But in actual fact, we should begin it, be beginning our projects by doing what's called a top task analysis, understanding what users want to do, what they want to achieve. OK, and then building something that meets those needs, not some internal driver within the organization. So very briefly, I want to look at how to do a top task analysis in case it's something you haven't come across before. It's a very simple methodology that enables you to establish what it is users want to do with your um, whatever service you're creating, rather than what you as an organization think they should do, if that makes sense. The first thing you do is gather a list of potential tasks that we think users might um, want to do. And we can gather these from all kinds of sources. We can talk to customer facing staff, people that are maybe in the support section or some uh, uh, you know, um, department that are talking to customers on a regular basis, what they're getting frustrated in, what they're wanting to achieve. Those people will be able to tell you a huge amount. You can also run customer surveys to better understand users. You can look at their uh, behavior on a site and look at the analytics and look at what they're looking at, what they're paying attention to as users, what people typing into search in, or, or on your site. 
because they're effectively saying what it is that they want and they need. We can look at social media to find out what they care about. And those things are the basis of the projects that we build, that we build things to meet those needs, those tasks, those questions. But of course, we'll end up with a massive list. It will be huge. So the next thing we need to do is shortlist that. So we create a, a shortlist of less than 100 tasks or questions. And we do that by removing duplicates, getting rid of the jargon, removing overlaps, all those kinds of things, grouping things together. Now, once we've got a list of 100 or less, it would be very easy for us to go, oh, yes, we know what users care about. They care about this, 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 and this. And that is almost always wrong. So instead, what we do is we get customers to vote, right? We get customers to vote their top five tasks. And we present them with that list of 100 different items. Now, you might say that's that's ridiculous. Getting people to complete, say, a survey of um, over 100 different items is insane. And it is insane. There is no way someone is going to go through every single one of those options. What they do instead is they say to themselves, because they can't look at every single one because there's too many, they think to themselves, what are my top five? And then look for those top five in the list. And you can provide autocomplete and ways of helping them find that. So what that does is it will eventually give you a list of top tasks. You'll find that 80% of people only care about 20% of the tasks and things out of that list of 100, right? So you'll get a much clearer idea of what the top tasks are, that 20%, and what the tiny tasks are, in other words, the things people are less concerned about, which will be the other 80%. So if you haven't come across top task analysis, after this presentation, um, uh, the PDF is going to be made available to you. And in the PDF, there will be this slide, which will include a link to an article on a list apart called Focusing on Top Tasks by Jeremy McGovern. It's an absolute great article that will really help dig into that. Top task analysis should be the absolute basis of what you're doing um, on a day to day basis um, with your um, you know, starting off your digital projects. But there are loads of other tools that that I can't get into in a huge amount of detail, which will help you research and understand your audience. Tools like empathy maps. Don't know whether you've ever come across empathy maps, but a really great way of understanding who your audiences are and articulating that. And again, there's going to be a link in the PDF um, to an article that I've written on um, empathy maps in UX design. Then there are things like customer journey maps that look at the customer journey over their life cycle. And the great thing about a customer journey is that you can see where in that journey your particular project that you're working on sits. Right. Is it at the beginning of the journey where they're only just starting out or are you helping existing clients and customers? OK, so understanding the journey is another crucial tool. And again, there's an article on that in the PDF. So you do all of this research up front. You understand who your customers are. And so far, that's not so different to a normal project, is it? But then things do start to get different. This is where we move from the, the normal project process that most projects have traditionally been run on to something that's much more tailored to digital. And it's basically a process that is primarily driven out of science and how scientific research happens. You come up with a hypothesis. You test that hypothesis. You learn from the results of that and try something new. You iterate and improve. So it's a cycle that you go round again and again. So you do your discovery phase, which is that upfront bit, that research I talked about. You come up with an idea of how to solve that problem. You build it, then you test it, then you iterate, and you build a new version of it and refine it and improve it and test it again and iterate it again and go round and round and round. And you can do that because building stuff is cheap in digital compared to physical products, as I said earlier, and because you get a load of data um, which you wouldn't get on a physical product. So it allows you to work in this iterative cycle until you're ready to launch. So let me give you an example of how that would work on practice. 
let's take a, a standard website, okay? So you've done your top task analysis. You know what people want to do on the website. You know what questions they've got, all right? Now, you can use that to, um, to go into what's called a card sorting exercise, which allows you to sort those questions and tasks into various categories that become the basis of your information architecture. Now, you're going to want to test that. Are users understanding that information architecture? So what do we need to do? We need to build something that we can test and then iterate upon. So that's where prototyping becomes such a, a, an intrinsic tool. So let's take an example. This is a very, very basic prototype. So what, what's happened here is essentially it's a, a prototype for a university, actually. Um, it's all it's done is it's taken that information architecture, whacked it into a content management system, um, and then put bullet points in on appropriate pages of what questions will be answered on this page, right? So when a user comes to this page, what questions um, are answered and what tasks can be completed? You can see, very unattractive. No design, really. The content hasn't actually been written. We've not used the proper technology. But it's enough for us to test the information architecture and find out whether we're going in the right direction. If we are, great, we can move on to the next round of iteration and improvement. Um, but if, if we've got problems with it, then we can tweak and improve this until we get the information architecture right. Then what we can do is start to iterate and improve on that prototype. So the designer can start introducing some basic layout into it. The content people can now start maybe sketching out some of the, the, the rough copy that might appear on this page. So you're refining and adding fidelity to your prototype. And then you go through another round of testing. This time, you're testing not just the information architecture, but you're also testing visual hierarchy, for example. For example, are people spotting that book now button down the bottom right hand corner, or is that getting a bit lost? So you go through more testing. And then once you've done that round of testing, you further refine your prototype. You start adding more design elements, add um, uh, more copy into it, or more refined copy, should I say. And that's how our digital products and services can evolve through an iterative cycle over time, rather than all of that being defined up front. And this prototype effectively replaces your functional specification, that big document that you create. And the difference is, is that it's tested, it's refined, and also you've started producing a lot of the elements that you need to build the final site. So this prototype then can become the basis for building that final site, which will continue to be tested and iterated upon. But do you know what? Even once you launch a website, there's still ongoing evolution that you need to do. You're not done when a website launches. The launch of a website is not the end of the project, but it's the minimum, uh, middle of the project at best. In fact, I would go as far as arguing that in a lot of cases, digital projects are never truly done. You should always be monitoring and improving those over time. Now, I write a lot more about this in how to adopt an iterative approach to UI design that you can check out afterwards if you want to uh, delve into that. But what I want to do now is move on to the opportunities that are available to us to test. Test in ways that wouldn't have been possible in a non-digital world. And so our project management methodologies and the way we run projects need to be updated accordingly. For a start, there is quantitative testing. So testing with statistically significant numbers of people. So typically, um, there are all kinds of different options available to you. And I just want to run through a brief number of them, ones that you can go away and you can research um, a lot more later. Things like A-B testing or split testing, as it's sometimes known. OK, so where you present different versions to different audiences um, uh, in order to see which performs the better. Right? That will give you statistically relevant results to help drive the direction of your design. Then, of course, there's analytics, going into Google Analytics and that kind of stuff. But in that situation, I would say beware of vanity metrics. 
Things like page views, user sessions, dwell times, and bounce rates really say very little about um, users and user behavior and whether or not they're actually getting value out of what you're producing. So let me give you an example. If someone comes into your website, hits a page, and then immediately leaves, is that a good or a bad thing? Does it mean they've hit your website, been confused, and then left? Or does it mean they've hit your website, found exactly the information they want, and then they've gone away happy? Equally, with dwell time, is that a sign that they're spending ages wandering around your site lost and confused? Or is it a sign that actually they're totally engrossed in your content? Equally, things like page views, you know, really, tell you more about um, uh, whether your your techniques for driving traffic are working or not, rather than the usability and effectiveness of whatever it is that you're um, testing. So when it comes to quantitative research, I would encourage you to start with a question. If you just look at analytics for that a clear question in your mind, you're going to get distracted by irrelevant data, distracted by those vanity metrics. So instead, go in with something tangible that you want to know. This is why I'm not a huge fan of Google Analytics, um, because I find that it's actually quite difficult to, to go in and get answers to a specific question, and you tend to get drawn into their generic um, vanity metrics. Instead, I prefer tools like Full Story. Full Story is a session recorder tool um, that you might want to check out. So it records sessions, but it also does something very interesting. It's not just recording sessions, it's recording the entire DOM, the, the entire document um, uh, object model. Now, what that means, if you're not technical, is that it means it's recording everything that the user um, experienced and saw um, uh, when they were working on your website. Now, because it's recording everything, all of the co um, code behind your website as well, it means that you can easily dig into historical data. So let's say you're watching a video back of a user moving around the website and they do something unexpected. Now, in Google Analytics, um, if you find that a user does, you know, if you find something that you think is unexpected and you want to know whether other users have done it, then you have to go in and create an event that allows you to look back at, you know, to then track that. And you have to leave it running for a while to see whether or not that particular thing is working. With something like Full Story, you don't need to because it's been recording everything about every user. So if you see a user doing something peculiar, you can dig into that and see whether other users have been doing that peculiar thing and, and watch videos and see how, what, why they're doing that. So things like session recorders are a very powerful tool. I'd also encourage you to look when it comes to quantitative research at search. What search terms are people entering into your search engine on your website? Because that gives you a real insight into what they're looking for. So there's a bit about quantitative testing. And um, there's another article you can check out to dig into that. But there's another type of testing that is equally important to that kind of analytical quantitative testing when you're testing a lot of people. And that's qualitative testing. So when you're testing a small group of people, um, which can then provide insights that analytics can't provide. So this is typically things like usability testing, right? Usability testing is an opportunity to talk and interact with people. <laughs> and so you learn insights that you wouldn't normally learn. So let me give you uh, a, a few tips about how to get the most out of quantitative testing, because I think there's quite a lot, to, uh, sorry, qualitative testing, because there's a lot of misunderstanding around things like usability testing. For a start, don't fret overly about demographics. A lot of people um, don't do usability testing because they think it's hard. And one of the reasons they think it's hard is because they, oh, we've got to find the right people. And that's really hard to do. But in truth, unless you are uh, aiming at a very unusual or not very unusual, but a more specific audience like children or old people that have certain cognitive or physical um, differences to them, then most people are, aren't that different when it comes to usability testing. Most people will struggle with the same kind of thing. Now, don't get me wrong, getting a demographically perfect audience is a bonus, and it is something you should strive to do, but it shouldn't stop you testing if you're struggling to do with that. 
In fact, you can test with pretty much anybody who isn't involved with the company or the product that you're testing. The second thing that I think a lot of people worry about is getting numbers, right? This is different from that quantitative testing we were talking about earlier. In this case, we don't need a huge number of people. Five or six is often enough, right? What's more important is that you test multiple rounds, okay? So where does that five or six come from? Well, it comes from an article by Jacob Nielsen, who's done a huge amount of uh, work and research into this field. And he found that beyond five or six people, the number of additional usability problems you were uncovering actually started reducing quite significantly. And so it, it isn't really worth testing a huge number of people beyond that. But what is worth doing is testing multiple times, because what happens is when you test in the first round, OK, then you'll uncover some problems and then you'll fix those problems. And when you test in the second round, it will uncover then more problems that were, were hidden before because you hadn't fixed the first lot. Makes sense? So you end up finding more problems as a result. Now, this whole area of usability testing and um, uh, a qualitative testing is fascinating. Um, and if you want to start looking at this, I recommend checking out a book called Rocket Surgery Made Easy. It's a book by um, Steve Krug. He wrote a more, um, more well-known one, which is um, Don't Make Me Think, which is a justification for um, doing qualitative testing of this regards. His follow-up book, Rocket Surgery Made Easy, really talks about the practicalities of how to make that happen in your organization, how to find time, et cetera. Another thing about usability testing that I would say is just forget the idea of a um, test lab, unless you've got the luxury of already having that in place. There are, um, there are some great tools that let you do it quickly and easily. One tool that I use all the time is something called lookback.io. All you need is a laptop and uh, you can do testing with lookback.io and it records what the user is seeing on the screen. It also records their face on, a, on the webcam. You can also use this tool remotely as well to, to do testing with people over a distance. So really the days of needing two-way mirrors and, and uh, you know, cameras and all of that kind of stuff they're, they're kind of gone. They're a bonus if you've got them, but you don't really need them. Now, if you've never done usability testing before and you want to have a go at it, then I'd recommend checking out this article on what goes into um, a user testing script. OK, so that that um, that kind of gives you a starting point to begin with. But you cannot you don't just have to test usability. You can also test design as well. So it's actually possible, believe it or not, to test, uh, test aesthetics as well as testing um, whether someone understands and use, can use something properly. Now, this can be very useful because oftentimes stakeholders have a lot of arguments and disagreements, don't they, over, over a design. Oh, I like the green. Oh, I don't like the green. And, and they compromise on blue and the designer doesn't get a say in it. And anyway, those stakeholders weren't even the target audience you were trying to reach. So being able to actually test design is a really useful thing. So one thing that I do at the beginning of projects when it comes to aesthetics is I try and establish some words, some words that represent what the organization wants to project to the world. Do they want to be you know, masculine or feminine? Do they want to be conservative or liberal? Do they want to be minimalistic or, or busy? You know, what are the words that are around the brand? And then, basically, you can put that in front of users. You could create a mood board or a design, and you can ask people which of the following words describe that design. Now, what you'll do is take your core words, the words you want people to, to pick, then you add to them their opposites. Then you throw in some other random words as well, and maybe some words you think people might go for, which aren't necessarily the words you want. And you create a big old list and you let people vote. Now, in that case, you do want to be testing demographically accurate people because aesthetic design is different from usability. You also want to try and test a bigger number of people, probably 30 plus, so you don't get results thrown off by you know, one or two individuals. But you can use your Facebook group or your Twitter group to do those kinds of things. Most of us have got social media followings associated with our brand. And that's a great opportunity to do this kind of testing. So again, I've written a number 
another article that covers this kind of stuff that you might want to check out. So there are so many opportunities for you to run your projects in a different way where you uh, where you create something, you test it with real users and you iterate it in this kind of scientific process. And do you know what? Even when you get it wrong, you learn something. You learn something that is a bad that enables you to improve it. And the result of all of this is a product that is much, much more effective, but also you substantially reduce the risk associated with the project. Because instead of a project being launched that um, is your best guess at what people are going to buy or what people are going to respond to it in whatever way, you're instead launching something you know will work because it's been thoroughly tested throughout the process. So that's my presentation. I've put together um, uh, somewhere where you can download it um, with the PDF and all the links and everything else I said, which is at boag.world forward slash Sitecore. But also, I know that the guys from Sitecore will send um, all of this through to you. Don't worry if you don't get that. OK, George, back over to you for some questions, I'm guessing. Paul, first of all, I want to say uh, this webinar to me, in any case, was extremely interesting uh, and insightful. Um, second of all, I actually have a question for you myself, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely fine. Now, that's a lot of things, now, a lot of things that you talked about, uh, in my opinion, have to do with internal company cultures, right? But however, mm -hmm. in my experience, uh, that's probably the hardest thing to change in a company. Now, how would you even go about that, and who should be the catalyst for this change? Because I think there's a lot of question of, you know, should it be from management, top down, bottom down, whatever it may be, I mean, bottom up, sorry, who should be the catalyst for this company culture change? That's a really good question. And actually, I've now written two whole books answering that question. So to, to do it quickly now is, is, is not easy. Yeah, I mean, a big part of the work that I do is with cultural change. My belief, uh, my belief is that whoever recognizes the need needs to be the catalyst for change. Because in truth, um, if you wait for management to get this and to understand it, you, it's never going to happen. You need to start, if you're the one that gets it, if you're the one convinced by what I've covered today, for example, then you need to be the catalyst to change. Now, in terms of how you achieve that, you don't try and achieve it all in at once. You don't try and implement everything I've talked about um, today because you will overwhelm people and they will react badly to it. So if I can just, I mean, like I said, I've written entire books on this, but if I could just give you one thing out of today that I would encourage you to start doing, is I would encourage you to start talking about user needs. Start talking about those questions and tasks. Start a project from the premise of what users will want to do rather than what we want to say, all right? If I could add one more thing on top of that, it would be to try out doing some usability testing, okay? And actually try your damnedest to get some other key stakeholders from the organization to sit in on those usability test sessions because nothing will change people's attitude more than seeing someone rant and wear and swear at your frustrating mobile app, website, whatever it be. It will completely transform people's thinking when they're exposed to users. And so any opportunity to expose them to users is worthwhile. If you can't get them in the room to do usability testing, to see usability testing in person, then what I recommend is recording those usability sessions with a tool like lookback.io that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then what you do is you edit down what I call a low lights video, the most sweary, angry, frustrated, annoyed bits of it. And you send that around to colleagues and say, hey, look, we need to do things differently. And that can be the start of the conversation. But like I said, I could do a, well, I do do regularly a multiple days workshop on this subject. <laughs> so we probably ought to take a different no, I, question. And move. No, I completely agree with you. Okay, thank you. I guess this is a good subject for our next webinar. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But probably. okay, we do have, we do have a lot of questions that came in. Um, some of them were during the presentation, so I hope they do make sense right now. Um, one of them is from William. William is asking, who are we testing with? Is this focus groups, team members, or the general public? Ah, very good question. Sorry, it's because I tried to cover so much ground, William, that, that I didn't maybe look cover that in, in so much detail. It's not with a focus group. 
right? I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a fan of focus groups, at, use, at least not for, for digital projects. The problem with focus groups is that you get one or two dominant individuals um, that tend to skew the conversation. And then you have quieter people who don't, um, don't participate and you don't really get their feedback. So almost all the testing I do, certainly with usability testing, is one-on-one, -on -one, right? In terms of who you want to test with, um, well, it, it's, it's certainly not team members. It's not anybody from inside the organization. You, you're looking to test ideally with um, people that are actually going to be end users of the product or service that you're talking about. OK, um, certainly when you're testing design, you want it to be that. When it comes to usability testing, so in other words, what I mean by usability testing is, could they find a certain piece of information or do they understand how this piece of functionality works? Then you can be a bit more loose, right? You doesn't need to be exactly the right demographic, okay? In those kinds of situations, you can use anybody from the general public that's roughly in approximately, you know, the same point of life, so they're either young or middle-aged or old kind of thing, and um, somebody that is not involved with the company or product in any way. Um, so those t that's typically who I look for. So hopefully um, that's helped answer the question a bit, William. But again, check out some of those articles I've included throughout because it, it, I explain it more depth there. Okay, fantastic. Uh, next question comes from Ben. Uh, ben is asking, how many users do you typically engage on each iteration? Cool. Yes, absolutely. Well, I actually um, I, I touched on that very briefly um, in this slide, which is Jacob Nielsen's article where he says why you only need to test with five users. So between five and five and six, that kind of level tends to be about the right for usability testing. Right. So that is can I find my way around that kind of testing? When it comes to design iteration type testing, uh, so de sorry, design iteration, no, it wasn't what I meant at all, design aesthetics, then you want to test with more people. The more people you can test with, the better, all right? But remember, you've got two types of testing. You've got quantitative, and then you've got qualitative. So usability testing is the second, it's qualitative. So it, you can test with a smaller number of people because you go more in depth. But you need both types. So that's where you also do quantitative stuff, which is where you look at analytics, where you're obviously looking at hundreds or potentially thousands or even more people to gain insights. But when it comes to that kind of sitting face to face, you really only need to test about five people per, per round. OK. Okay, hey, fantastic. Um, we have one more question coming in. Um, this one is, with projects transitioning into mobile and app devices, would these digital project recommendations work and translate similarly within those environments as well? Yes, which is a, a, is a boringly short answer. Um, but th that's the truth of it. I mean, all of these principles apply really to, to um, pretty much any digital platform. So whether you're talking about a mobile app, whether you're talking about a digital marketing campaign, whether you're talking about, you know, a website, whatever, you could use this 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 same process of hypothesize, build, test, iterate um, on any of those. Um, and actually, there's some amazing stuff being done around mobile app. Um, mobile and app development um, in this kind of areas. It also, the other a big area that is often not used on where it really, really should be is those internal tools that we use, all right? Those tools like um, intranets or enterprise systems that run at the back end. We tend not to, to be as rigorous in our, our processes with that because we see them as secondary or, or unimportant in some way. But the truth is, especially with usability testing, you can make huge efficiency savings if you build these tools and they're easy and quick to use right um you know it's some i'm horrified at the state of some of these internal tools um that people are expected to use and sure they're forced you know employees have no choice but to use them but they can sometimes waste hours trying to do something that should be simple and straightforward it be claiming expenses or booking a customer in for a visit you know these things should be simple but they're so often not 
All right, Paul, thank you. Uh, for the moment, that's all the questions we have. Uh, so, guys, thank you very much for being very engaged with Paul today, um, and thank you very much for actually joining us uh, for this webinar. Paul, I'd like to take the time to thank you once again for your third webinar. Uh, as I've mentioned, it was extremely interesting, um, and I think I speak for everyone where I say we've learned a lot today. Good stuff. So guys, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we hope you're going to join us for much more uh, webinars to come, and I'd like to wish everyone a fine afternoon and a good night wherever you are.